what you're saying as much for the staff as it is for anybody else because they need to practice with it to actually get their deficiencies because right now they're even with everything that I've built for them it's still like they need to just drill through it drill through it and get there. I've had, I've had a lot of staff tell me that um, the, the, the most that they learn are when they're staffed in with an, on an engagement with me, you know, because I require it. You know, if, if you're going to work on one of my audit engagements, um, you, you need to, when I tell you to do this, you're going to use ID. We require it on pretty much all engagements at this point. That's like where we are with it. We're doing it. So, yeah. employees, seven directors, 25 audit staff, tax staff, we have some administrative staff, and maybe like 35 professional CPAs or CPA candidates to kind of them. Um, so uh, we're relatively small. Mm -hmm. But um, the when we had peer review a couple years ago, our peer review firm was three offices, you know, maybe 300 employees. Mm -hmm. And they came in and they were like, you guys use the software more than we do. And you guys are, are, are using it a lot more than we do. And you have more people who are trained on it than we do. And, and I took that as a compliment. You know, I, I, I want to, I want to make sure that you don't have to use it for everything, right. but understand what it can do, and then decide. You know, you the big guys all using it for everything, but I mean, they farm it out, so it doesn't really count. Like uh, uh, one of my colleagues or previous good friends and uh, colleague before he went to Deloitte, and the way they use it is they get the data done from the client. They have the way India. They send it to the way India, who runs the reports, and they give them all the reports back. <laughs> Which is, but they also do that with cash. They don't test cash themselves. They should take on it out, stuff like that. But I mean, they use it for every single area. They do every single test possible for the SAS management testing. So, and I'm glad that they use it in every single section of their audit areas. So there's like two of all the uh, big firms now. Mm -hmm. They have the resources to pay for like overlays over the, the software itself. So they've got like macros built into the software itself. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not a power user. <laughs> I I don't know. I, I've never used the correlation analysis, the trend analysis, uh, like the, um, yeah. scripting. I, I you know I took a scripting class, but. Eh. I'm the only one here, and uh, I, haven't, I haven't really gotten into that. Um, so this is going to be a real fundamental join formulas, you know, sort of functionality. Yeah, I mean that's that's what I'm looking for is because I, I even if I can use some of the more advanced features, I can't ask my staff to do a lot of that. It's not. Exactly. There's a there's a cost benefit of how much time can I put in formula asking for the data, verifying that it's correct, and then even if it is correct, I got to do the procedure. You know, so is that all of that time well spent versus whatever it is I'm doing currently? And um, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a head, a head, you know, head of the engagement decision. Um, so we'll see. Kelly, you still there? I am. How's how are we doing in the room there? We have uh, Matt. Matt. We have Matt here from uh, Ellen and Tucker. Good morning, Matt. How are you today? 
morning, how are you? Doing well, thank you. We appreciate you joining us. Yeah, glad to be here. It looks like we have eight other attendees online joining us virtually. Okay. Um, I don't know. Do you do you want to wait and see if a few more people filter in? What What would you like to do, Chris? Um, let's wait uh, until twenty of. Can we wait? Can we wait until then, and then um, and then we can get started. Sure. I'll, I'll start the presentation, and if if more people trickle in, then great. If not, then. Matt is going to get his own personal presentation. Right. Hey, that's great. I think it'll be a good uh, a good setup for you guys uh, to interact. So do your thing and let me know if there's anything that I can do from here. Oh, um, there is a sign-in sheet. At some point, would you mind completing that? Chris? Yeah. I do have some documentation on the uh, version 10 release. Would, okay. you, would you like me to upload that into the handouts? Uh, sure. I haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't, our firm hasn't updated to that, but um, I, I can, I can mention that the, the, the update is available and, um, you know, to refer to those materials if you'd like. Let me see how easily I can access it and get it loaded into those handouts real quick. Okay. My screen's not shared currently, is it? No. Would you like for me to do so? Uh, we can. Okay, let me go ahead and knock that out. Okay, I got the V10 uh, presentation there. Okay, Chris, you're on. Outstanding. So we're going to wait until about 8:40, and then we'll then we'll start. I believe so. That sounds fine to me. Okay. Where is your office located? Um, or right in the Inner Harbor, right by World Pass Street. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Harbor. Yeah. This is a nice one, actually, in the office. I live in the Canada area, so I like to work. It's awesome. And then we have a couple people, a couple people who were down there, and we just had our uh, Christmas party at oh, the yeah. aquarium. So it was nice for them to you know, they could just kind of walk around yeah. and not have to drive. Yeah, it's really nice. It has. So it has. Walking is uh, pretty easy. Yeah. 
Soda, there's coffee over there. That's one of the reports you get the client to work with. That is, so we're going to do, we're going to go through a, an example of a sample audit. And <coughs> The three reports are meant to represent things that you get in an audit package from a custodian or a trustee. And uh, yeah, and so um, you know, when you're planning the audit, you say, "Hey, in January, you tell the the client, hey, we're going to start our audit in late May. Can you get John Hancock to?" send me a CD that has all the reports and the investment certification and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know? All right. Um, I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Chris Lehner, and I am a manager here at Stegman and Company. We are a single mem uh, single office CPA firm in Towson, Maryland, and we service public and private companies. We do public audits, non-public audits, reviews, tax returns. Um, just standard CPA firm stuff. And about five years ago, uh, we decided that we were not sufficiently testing the completeness of our journal entries. And so I head up, headed up a team that uh, evaluated the different software options, Excel um, and, and some others, and tried to figure out what the best option was as far as a software package that could efficiently and effectively evaluate and analyze large amounts of data and provide good audit documentation for, for our audits. And so long story short, we chose IDEA and ever since then I've been trying to figure out the best way to incorporate the software into uh, various audit engagements. So we'll use it for accounts receivable testing, confirmation selections, um, inventory price testing, and you know a whole whole host of of, of for profit, not for profit uh, company things. And uh, just recently, within the probably the last two years, I've been using it in. Uh, 
uh, some of the ERISA audits that, that our firm does. We probably do about 35 um, uh, ERISA audits. Most of those are defined contribution 401k plan audits. And um, they're they're limited scope, so they're um, you know there's not a lot of variation in the the type of information that we get. And so at the AICPA Employee Benefit Conference this year, I was talking to one of the representatives there, and she said that um, you know we have the the Washington area uh, independent user group, and so I volunteered to do a presentation, and I thought that this was an area that users may not be um, uh, incorporating the software into their audits and uh, it would be a good topic to introduce some of the things, some of the ways that um, that we use it in our firm. I am not a super user of IDEA. Um, I don't get into uh, some of the more complex calculations, the correlation analysis and trend analysis and um, scripting and some of those things. So uh, I think that this will be a, a demonstration of some of the using some of the just the fundamental tools that, that that's within IDEA. So I'm hoping that um, even if you just started using the software, that it's not going to be um, too too over your head. The first thing that we're going to go through are some of the planning uh, considerations that you need. To um, to consider when you're planning one of these audits, obviously you're going to need to um, contact the appropriate individuals to get the information out of out of them, um, and you're going to need to understand some of the characteristics of the plan. Um, while most plans have contributions and distributions, um, as you all know, if you've done a defined contribution audit before. Each plan has its own set of quirks. Maybe it's a um, an auto enrollment plan. Maybe um, there's um, employer safe harbor matching. Um, maybe there's um, you know a whole host of other different things um, that you need to make sure that you're aware of before you get into this. The next thing that I'm going to go through are some of the challenges that I have encountered when doing the, the defined contribution audits prior to um, incorporating ideas. So maybe you can um, sympathize, empathize with me on, hey, we're doing this procedure and it's, it's really kind of a pain and um, I think that maybe there's an easier, more effective, more efficient way to do it. And so what we're going to do is I've created a sample uh, defined contribution plan and I'm going to demonstrate some of the functions that you're able to um, to use to document and incorporate into your audit file some of the procedures that you do. And um, hopefully it's beneficial um, to everyone involved. If you have questions, um, please reach out. Um, I'm hoping this is a, a interactive uh, presentation. So uh, my email and my uh, phone number and contact information is at the end. So if you have um, a any questions, uh, please let me know. If you're if you're bored and twiddling your thumbs at, at your desk one day, send me an email about an idea. So the first thing that you obviously need to understand is the scope of the defined contribution audit that you're working on. Um, just so everybody is on the same page, there's two different types. Of, of, uh, of, of generally 401k audits. There's a limited scope and a full scope audit. With a full scope audit, uh, you need to test investments and investment transactions. Um, in a limited scope audit, what you're able to do is you're able to obtain from either the custodian or the trustee or some other qualified institution a certification that the investments and the investment income are uh, complete and accurate as of the year end and the year that you're up that is under audit. So um, one of the issues that we have had is um, testing the investment income because uh, maybe there's not a lot of documentation related to that 
and um, you know there, there's a lot to it. Obviously, most of these plans, uh, the only assets that they have are are, are investments. So uh, you want to understand um, the whether you're able to obtain a an investment certification or not. The next thing you obviously want to do is you want to make sure that you're identifying the three people or the three individuals that you're going to be dealing with the most in these audits. The first is who is the trustee, and the trustee is responsible for um, executing investment transactions and um, preparing reports and allocating investment income and any other types of transactions, contributions, distributions to the various participants of the plan. Uh, the next person that you want to make sure that you, you talk to is the third party administrator. Some plans have these, some plans don't. Um, but I found that the plans that do have a third party administrator can sometimes help me figure out um, you know, what I'm asking for with the, with, you know, as far as trustee uh, information or reports. Um, sometimes the third party administrator will prepare the 5500 or um, you know some of the discrimination testing, so they're very uh, involved in the in the audit as well. Thirdly, uh, you want to make sure that you're talking to the right person at the uh, at the plan sponsor. They're going to be your go-to for introducing you to who is the trustee and who is the third-party administrator, and so um, you're going to want to make sure that they're on board with uh, with the types of testing and the information that you're going to want to get. The next consideration is what types of contributions are there? And I've identified five different types of contributions. And the first is participant pre-tax contributions. The second is participant after-tax or, or Roth contributions. The third is participant rollover contributions. The fourth is employer matching, and then the fifth is employer discretionary. And so the information that you get from these, uh, from the trustee or the custodian, you want to make sure that, that those types of transactions are associated with the character of the contribution, either pre-tax, Roth, matching, um, because that's going to have an impact on whether you're going to be testing for forfeitures, if there's vesting, um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, the next two are, are, are interrelated, and you want to make sure that you understand how much the plan sponsor is involved in the audit or, or, or the administration of the plan. So I've had two different types of plan sponsors. The first is a, a plan sponsor who the employees need to uh, come to that HR manager or the or the controller with a, a signed form that says, "Hey, I want to I want to change my deferral percentage from five to eight percent, and here's my signed form." And uh, the plan sponsor also um, authorizes distributions from the plan. They have all the information on loans that are taken out by the participants, and so the plan sponsor is very involved in the administration of the plan. The, uh, the other type of plan sponsor that I've dealt with is somebody who I show up for the first day of field work and they introduce me to the, for instance, the John Hancock uh, representative and says, hey, I don't know anything about the plan. Go talk to uh, John Smith at Hancock and uh, let me know if you have any issues. So they've taken a very hands-off approach to the administration of the plan. Uh, their philosophy is, hey, we pay uh, this large uh, brokerage um, a, a good chunk of money to administer our plan and take care of everything for us, so I don't need to be involved anymore. And you want to make sure that the plan sponsor is educated about what their responsibilities are. And so even though the plan sponsor is, has contracted and outsourced, a lot of the administration of the plan, ultimately the plan sponsor is still uh, responsible for the information and for making sure that the information is, is accurate. And so um, with with the hands-off part for the hands-off plan sponsor, 
a lot of times um, participants are able to log onto a website and administer their own account. They can change investment elections. They can change the deferral percentages. They can request distributions. They can request loans, all those sorts of things. And so if they're able to do that, a lot of times there's not a, lot, there's not a paper trail that we can follow. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to audit these plans. Um, conversely, if you have a very involved administrator, you want to understand what the controls are at that plan sponsor for um, authorizing the correct amount of the distribution, making sure the terminated participants are uh, notified what their rights are as far as the plan, rollover options, etc. And so you want to make sure that you're documenting and um, perhaps even testing the controls that are over contributions, distributions, investments, etc. And so um, that will get into uh, a little bit of the SOC 1 evaluation reports. Um, and and in, the, in the example that I show you, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that again. The last thing that I think is important is to understand um, how the participants or how the employees are paid. And so are they salary employees or are they hourly or commission employees? And so what that means is that if they're salaried employees, generally they're gonna have, you're going to have recurring amounts, of the, of recurring transactions of the same amount. So if a participant is paid $1,000 every, every week and defers 10% of their salary, you should theoretically see recurring transactions of $100. And so this will lead into some of the analytical procedures that you that you may do with the contributions because if you don't see that $100 occurring regularly, you're going to want to ask the question to the plan sponsor, why is it not $100? Conversely, if they are hourly or commissioned employees, you're going to see a lot of variable um, amounts and it's not going to be a consistent consistent uh, pay scale. The other part of the payroll process that you want to understand is how often are the employees paid? Are they paid on a monthly basis? Are they paid bi-weekly, semi-weekly, monthly, you know, whatever it is. Um, and you want to understand that obviously because that's the way that the employees contribute. And um, that'll, that'll lead into some of the uh, delinquent contribution testing that we do um, that, I, that I demonstrate later on. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Yes, there are um, there are uh, a number of participants that are that are participating with us online. All right. So as I touched on uh, just a second ago, um, you want to make sure that you understand what the participants are able to do with the online portals. So I'm going to use uh, John Hancock throughout the part, throughout the presentation, um, but you know this also applies to Fidelity, to Wells Fargo, to uh, State Street, to any of these guys. I'm just going to use probably John Hancock because a lot of my plans have them. And so a lot of the challenges that I have in these audits is figuring out how do I verify that a participant actually requested that 5% of their salary was deferred into the plan? If the participant uses an online portal and is able to change their, their deferral percentages online, there's not going to be a, a, an easily obtainable paper trail on that. And so what you need to do is you need to make sure that the SOC 1 reports, hopefully it's a type 2 report, where the uh, service auditor is not only describing what the controls are at the, at the uh, institution, but is also testing the effectiveness of those controls. You want to make sure that there are controls that were tested over the, the contribution amounts, the contribution changes, things like that. Um, one of the other issues that I have is the, the testing of investment income allocation. Now, when I was doing this, uh, when I was setting up this uh, sample plan, 
I had in my mind that this was a limited scope plan or a, a limited scope audit. And so with a limited scope audit, we've already got an investment certification that says the investment balances are complete and accurate at December 31st. And our investment income is also uh, complete and accurate for the year end of 2014. But that doesn't get me to whether John Smith's balance has been properly calculated as far as investment income. And so we've taken the position as a firm that you need to do something at the participant level to make sure that the investment income has been properly allocated to the participants. I know that um, dividends, interest, realized and unrealized capital gains for the entire plan are $850,000, but did the, the CEO who's fraudulently manipulating the records, um, is, is, is his balance um, uh, been misappropriated too much, in, too much investment income at, to the detriment of the other employees, the, the other participants. So um, the, the investment income testing that I'll, that I'll demonstrate in a few minutes um, is, is, is a good test, I think, for both a limited scope and a full scope audit um, as far as the investment income allocation. So again, I don't, I don't think you heard the beginning of my presentation. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a super user of Excel or of, of IDEA. Um, I don't do trend analysis. I don't do scripting or anything like that. I have a basic understanding of the software. And so I'm going to go through uh, the sample. These are some of the things that we're going to go through. We're going to import um, a, a hypothetical report that I get from a trustee with all of the investment uh, transactions for the year. I'm going to do a join of two different databases. I'm going to show you how to select a sample of participants for testing. We're going to do two different types of, of extractions, a key value and a direct extraction. Um, I'm going to add fields to uh, a database. Uh, we'll do a, a report of contributions by participant that we can include in the audit file. And I'll show you how field statistics can be incorporated into the, into the, into the audit for, uh, for investment income allocation. Um, so these are the audit procedures that I'm going to demonstrate. Um, and uh, I think that pretty much every uh, defined contribution plan that I've worked on has to at least um, touch on some on these procedures. So. Um, I, I can't use IDEA for everything, but uh, for these for these items, um, I think that it is very useful. So, obviously, the first step is to figure out how to get the data that I need to import into IDEA, and this is often the hardest step, the very first one, because um, if you haven't done it before. Um, a lot of my uh, trustees that I've dealt with say, you're asking for what? Do you know how much, how much data that's going to be? That's going to be a huge file. And I tell them, I understand that. Um, you know, so if I've never done it before, if they've never run it for me before, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with not for the whole plan, but I'll ask for maybe one participant or one month or something along those lines to see if um, the data seems reasonably accurate uh, for importing. Um, so when I'm asking for the data, um, there's there's five different fields that I want to make sure that um, that I get. The first is some way to identify the different participants. Obviously, the the best way to do this is by name, but um, if you have you know four different John Smiths in your plan. Maybe you're going to need to have your social security number as well, or the last four digits of the social security number, or an employee ID, or something that is able to differentiate the different participants in the plan that you're auditing. The next uh, field that you're going to need is the investments. And so, as I said earlier, most of these plans are uh, you know, 
95 to 100 percent investments. And so you need to make sure that you understand whether it's this is a mutual fund, the pool of separate accounts, if there's stocks, bonds, uh, employer stock, things like that. You're going to need to make sure that you understand what the investment is being transacted. You're going to want to make sure that you understand what the transaction type is. So there's really only a few different types of transactions in these plans. You've got contributions, you've got distributions, maybe you have a, uh, an administrative expense fee allocation, um, maybe you have uh, dividends, um, uh, and so you know, the, the, the variety of the transaction types isn't very much, um, but you won't, do want to make sure you do that. Uh, date uh, fields, so that you can make sure that you understand uh, the, the date of the transaction. One of the hiccups that I found sometimes is making sure that I understand whether this is a settlement date or a trade date. So, um, you know, that, that will affect the, uh, the um, the information that I'm that I'm getting from uh, I'm going to get information from Yahoo Finance, so obviously you want to make sure that you understand the information that you're getting, what the date is, and obviously the amount. Um, what is um, helpful, and I, I generally try to push the custodians or the trustees to get me the information, is the um, the net asset value of the investment transaction or the stock price of the of the, of the stock that's being transacted. Something that I can verify. Um, with an independent source. And then um, I, I probably should have uh, put the last item up into the necessary, um, but you want to understand what the character is of the transaction. And so if a plan um, provides for both pre-tax and Roth, the custodian is required to keep those items separate. Um, and so you want to make sure that you understand if the transaction is on a pre-tax basis, the employer matching contribution, because obviously matching and employer um, uh, contributions can be subject to vesting, um, whereas participant contributions generally are not. Questions on that? Right. So, um, one of the handouts that um, I've, I've provided for you is a, um, a sample of what you may receive from a trustee or a custodian uh, in an audit package, in a standard audit package. And so I created this plan uh, from scratch. Um, I, I boiled down some of the uh, information um, for simplicity's sake. But I think that it touches a lot of the different things that I found in my audits. Um, so we're doing an audit, a uh, limited scope audit for 2014 for the McNulty Brewing Company. And we've done this uh, audit for the last uh, two years, 2012 and 2013. This is the 2014 audit. And so we don't have any issues with testing beginning balances or anything like that. Employees are immediately eligible to participate, and so um, you know I don't have any deferred. I, I can match up a higher date with um, you know transaction dates if they if they choose to participate. Uh, there's no employer contributions, but um, there are uh, participant contributions. Um, the payroll or the the plan sponsor pays all of the administrative fees, so I don't have any um, fee allocations uh, allocated to the participants. There are uh, four uh, mutual funds that the participants can select from to allocate their contributions. Um, I picked these randomly on the site that I was on uh, when I designed this thing. Uh, the first is the T. Rowe Price Summit Municipal Income Fund. There's the Vanguard Tax Managed Fund, Goldman Sachs Fund, and the Fidelity Fund. Yes? Can the participants select from one or all? What is the they can do whatever they want. So um, if you if if you look at the uh, one of the reports, there's two participants who got, they decided to go. I think it was 50-50. Okay. And so um, they can that you know a participant can say I want 100 percent of my contribution to go into the T Rowe Price uh, Muni Income Fund, or they could say I want 25 percent to go to the Muni Fund, Vanguard Fund, Goldman Sachs, Fidelity. Does that answer your question? Yeah, they're free to select. Absolutely. The combination. Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, as I said, uh, I, I tried to um, not throw too many monkey wrenches into this thing, but uh, three things that we're going to want to uh, have in the back of our minds as we're going through the testing is that one participant, Ned Einhorn, he was hired in May of 2014. Rose Thompson, she got a raise in August of 2014. She was doing a fantastic job for us. And then Linda Morris, she was not doing a good, good job. So she was terminated in 2014 as well. Um, and so the, the handouts, as I said, are three reports that I found are common in a standard audit package from, from a trustee. Um, the first is a report of the balances and the activities by participant. So um, obviously this plan would not be subject to an audit because it only has 15 participants, but roll with me here. So we've got 15 participants and each one of them has activity in their accounts. And so all but Ned have beginning balances. Not all of them contribute. Um, only one had a distribution, and all of them had investment income. And the investment income field is represents dividends, um, interest, realized, and unrealized capital appreciation. So you want to make sure that you understand what is going through um, the investment income field. And then obviously we have the ending balance. The second report is a report. It's got the same ending balance, same uh, totals at the bottom, but it's allocated by fund. And so we've got four different investments, and so the beginning balance is 495, which agrees to the same uh, reporter on the participant side, which is good. Uh, we've got contributions, investment income, distributions, and ending balance. So the same fields, but only on, a, uh, on an investment basis. And then the third report, um, that I found is common is a report of the detailed transactions in the plan for the year. And so a lot of times when I initially ask a, a, a trustee for, um, for information, they say, that's included in the audit package. You already got that information. But the problem with this report is, number one, it doesn't have the information by participants. And so um, you can try to figure out um, some of the dates that things were transacted on, but I haven't found it very helpful in my audits. I don't usually use it. Um, the other issue that I have with it is that um, unrealized appreciation is not a booked transaction. And so on a daily basis, the trustee does not record a transaction for the increase or decrease in the stocks or the, the, the investment. And so that's a big part of the investment income. And so these reports only have contributions, distributions, fees, things like that that are you know, actually transacted, actually cash transactions. So um, I guess long story short, I, I, I included this to show you the uselessness of it. Questions? All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to run three different tests in idea uh, related to contributions. And so um, I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint presentation here and get into idea. And so um, luckily, the trustee that I was dealing with for this audit was able to give me um, was able to give me information. This is all the information. This was in my audit package. Um, but in addition, I was able to get the, um, the details of the, the transactions. And so this is IDEA version 9. Um, we haven't upgraded to IDEA version 10 yet. There is a, a brochure that's available um, on, the, on the website regarding uh, version 10, but we're going to be using version 9. And so I'm going to import from Excel uh, 
kidding me? This was working a minute ago. I apologize for the uh, IT issue. Operations, but our auditors are still in the Excel management. Do you think it's the program? The it's locked up. Chris? Yes. Do you normally use dual screens? Uh, yes. Okay. I think that it's because of that. Um, there's a shortcut I'm trying to remember. Uh, hold the Alt and hit the space bar, I think should help you get the screen back over to where you want it. Uh, let's see. Oh. We good? I think I think I've got it. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself again. Try this again. Thank you. No problem. All right. <laughs> IT issue solved. And so we're going to import this. All right. And the same issue with the coffee. <laughs> no problem. No worries about that. It's over full. Um, all right. Hopefully we don't have any more of these issues, so I apologize for that. All right. So um, this is the uh, import from Excel of the information that the trustee provided to me. And the fields that I have are Participant identifier, I'm able to identify last names and first names. I don't have any duplicates there. The transaction type, um, I've got three different transaction types in, in this database. Um, I've got contributions, I've got dividends, and I have uh, distributions. Again, I don't have any forfeitures because I only have uh, participant contributions, so um, participant contributions are always 100% vested. They're not subject to forfeiture. And the plan sponsor pays all of the administrative fees, so there's no um, uh, administrative fee uh, transaction type. You okay? Oh, I'm fine. Right. I was just over full. I feel, I feel bad for your furniture. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, next field that we have is a transaction date field. This is the, um, the uh, date that I, I need it to be as far as the investments uh, transaction selection. Um, I have a, obviously an amount, I have a money type, everything in this uh, example is on a pre-tax basis, but you could easily have um, employer matching, safe harbor matching, discretionary, you know, whatever that is. And then I have the investment ticker, so I'm able to identify um, of the investment election that the participant selected, what investment is this transaction associated with. When I'm importing the information, uh, the rule of thumb that I use is that every field should be a character field except numeric and date fields. And so the example that I use a lot of times is uh, for a trial balance or a chart of accounts account number. 
And so sometimes my client will have their cash account as um, account number 1,000. And so when I import that into IDEA, it thinks that it's a numeric field called 1,000. But I don't care what the account numbers add up to. And so what I'll do is um, I'll evaluate the, uh, the field type and change the account number field from a numeric field to a character field. So everything that I've imported is a character field except for the date field, the transaction date, which is, a, is obviously a date type, and the transaction amount, which is a numeric field. And we'll get out of that. All right. So back to our contributions reports. The first report that I'm going to run is a summary of participant contributions by date for the entire plan. So I've set up my quick access toolbar. I have a lot of the functions that I regularly use on that. And so we're going to summarize these transactions by date. We're going to add up the transaction amounts. But as I said before, I've got different types of transactions. I've got contributions, dividends, and distributions. But I don't only want the contributions. So uh, we're going to select the criteria here where the transaction type is only contributions. Yes, I believe it is case sensitive. Give this thing a name. And so what I have is a summary of all of my participant contributions by date. And um, you can look at this analytically and see that um, my first transaction of 2014 occurred on the 10th. And my next transaction, my next contribution, was on the 24th. So why is that important? Why is that variance important? Well, if I understand what my payroll process is, I can understand that, yeah, it makes sense that the, the, the payroll period that was associated with the 10th was, was remitted, and then two weeks later, I've got another pay period. And so um, this would be what I would use as documentation for my test of delinquent contributions. And so you can, you can throw this into the file and um, you know, put a work paper note on there that says, um, we understand that we've talked to the client about uh, their payroll process. They're paid every two weeks. We've evaluated the information and, um, you know, draw a conclusion regarding that. Uh, one of the hiccups that I put in here was that um, I had a June 27th participant contribution remittance, but my next one wasn't 14 days later. And so, just analytically, I don't know anything other than analytics here, but analytically, I would have expected that to be earlier. I would have expected that to be earlier. And then we get back on track for July 25th. So obviously the difference between here and here is four weeks. But this July 22nd, that would be a potential uh, delinquent contribution date. So I'd ask for that. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm going to close this. And then the next report that I'm going to run is a summary of participant contributions by participant for the entire plan. Uh, do the same sort of thing. We're going to summarize by last name. I'm going to add first name in there too. We're going to add up the transaction amounts. Again, I only want the contributions. So I'm going to set a filter. Or a criteria, transaction type equals contribution. Four dash four. And 
and that's the report. One thing that is important to understand as you're going through this data is that how many participants do I have in my plan? I have 15 participants in my plan, but only nine of them have contributions. And that makes sense because um, maybe I have um, an old participant um, who, was, who was terminated earlier. Um, maybe I have just you know, uh, a participant or an employee who doesn't want to participate anymore. You know, they were participating, but they didn't want to contribute anymore. And so as you're selecting your samples, you want to keep in mind that not necessarily every participant is going to have contributions. But when you're testing participants, those are contributing and non-contributing participants. You want to pay, pay attention to that. So I have nine, nine participants who are contributing. I can throw this report into my uh, audit file and agree that to um, the custodian's report. And so if you look at the custodian report, the participant summary report um, that I got from, um, from the audit package, you can see that Greg Brink had contributions of 1440 according to the trustee and he had 1439.88 according to this report. Not a huge difference, it's not something that I would follow up on. Uh, Vivian Brown, she had 760, uh, 759.98. If I go over here to uh, my field statistics, I see that the total of all of my contributions was 31,698.05. If I look at my participant summary report and, and my investment summary report, that materially agrees. So, if I was skeptical, which I always should be, that the data that I received from the custodian was accurate, this gets me a little bit more comfortable that I have all of the transactions. At least I have all of the contribution transactions, and that makes sense. All right. On your last report, can you just open one of the, uh, the cells of all contributions? On the report that I just ran? Yep. One of these? Yep. And so this was net Einhorn. And so um, on the, the summary report, or the on, the on the slide that I was showing you about some of the basics of how our plan worked, um, he only started participating, he was hired in May of 2014. And so it makes sense that he doesn't have any January, February, March, or April transactions. And so also if you look at the participant summary report, Ned was in, in, invested in the, uh, what's that, the, much, the T. Rowe Price Summit Municipal Income Fund, the PRINX is the ticker. And so the investment ticker here, that agrees as well. Only that's only his contributions because that's what I selected the criteria as. It doesn't have, uh, if he took a distribution, I can see on the participant summary report that he didn't take a distribution. Um, and it doesn't include, what it doesn't include that is on the full report is any dividends. Right, interest, investment income. Mm -hmm. It's not an investment. Yep. 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 Make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. That. All right. So the next thing that I want to run is a detailed report of participant contributions for only the participants that I'm selecting for testing. So um, the, the two reports that I've run previously were for the entire plan. This is only going to be for my sample selection. So first thing that I need to do is I need to select a sample of, my, of the participants that I'm going to test. And again, this report is not the report that I would test my contributions from because this report only has the participants that have contributions. 
And so I, not only do I want to make sure that, for instance, Greg, Greg Brink had 1439.88 of contributions, but I may also want to verify that Linda Morris had zero contributions. That's just as important to me as making sure that the, the, the amount that is present is accurate. I want to make sure that the amount that is not present is also accurate. Does that make sense? So I can't select my sample from this. What I need to select my sample from is all of the participants. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize activity. I don't even need to add up the amounts because I don't care. I need basically a report of participants. And this gives me my 15. And so from here, I can do a random sample, uh, you know, however you determine the, the proper sample number, um, you know, statistical sampling, test control sampling, substantive, whatever it is. Um, you need to calculate the number of participants that you're sampling. But let's say I selected, I went through the procedures, and uh, I came up with five. So I'm going to test five participants. And so I've got Pat, Rose, Chip, Murray, and John. One consideration, another consideration is participant eligibility testing. And so when I'm selecting my participants, these participants are in the plan because they have balances in the plan. I have two possible exceptions when I'm doing my participant eligibility testing. I've got Participants who are participating in the plan who shouldn't be. And I've also got participants who are not participating in the plan that should be. Does that, very, does that difference make sense? And so if I'm testing participant eligibility, these participants are already in the plan. And so they're only going to satisfy one of those exceptions. They may be improperly eligible. I also need to select my participants to test the participants that should be in the plan but aren't. And so if I selected, if I calculated um, a sample size of five, I shouldn't take my entire sample from this report because they're only going to set the employees who are eligible to participate but are not participating, they're not going to show up on this report. So my population is incomplete. But I need to select my participants from not only the, event, the investment information that I have, but I need to have a second source. And so if I have um, a, a sample size of five, I might take four from the, from the plan, but I'll select one from payroll records or from W-2s, or something along those lines. So I, I wanted to mention that because um, sometimes it, it, it gets confusing about what you're actually looking for, and you obviously need to make sure that you understand the information that you have. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you want your universe to be your entire payroll set. Exactly, yeah. But for this purposes, um, uh, we're, only, we're going to test these five participants. So now I'm going to run a detailed report. of 
the transactions for the participants that I've selected. So I'm going to do a join function where my primary database is all of my data. My secondary database is just those five participants that I've selected for testing. I only want the matches. And so what I've got is all of the transactions just for the five participants that I've selected for testing. And let's do a um, we'll do a key value extraction based on the transaction type. So I've only got contributions and dividends in this in this report. I only want the contributions. And so this is a list of only the contributions for my selected participants. Now I can run a report. based on last name, I'm going to break on this field, on the last name field, I'm going to add that up, don't need that, that doesn't make any difference, and I'm going to preview the report. And so what this is, it's a little hard to see because of the font, but this is a list of all of John Gray's contributions. And John Gray was one of these participants who had multiple investments. You were saying before whether they, they can allocate between different investments. And so John Gray is invested both in the, um, in the Fidelity Fund and the Vanguard Fund. And so he's got, on January 10th I can see it, He's got two different transactions. Which make up one contribution. And so I can analyze this. I can take a look through this report and see if there's any variances in these in these amounts. So they all should be generally the same. Unless he went online and decided to change his investment allocation. And I've got uh, Chip Thompson. I've got, I've got all of my participants. I could throw this into the into my audit file and do an analytical procedure to verify that um, all the contributions make sense. So if I test one of these contributions and verify that yeah, he only wanted that percentage of his income for that pay period deferred into the plan. I can make a reasonable conclusion that all of those contributions are accurate. Usually I'll do this through confirmation procedure, so I may uh, send him a, a letter that says, hey, these were your contributions, this was your investment allocation, does this seem right? Um, if it does, uh, please let me know. So that's a good report that I'll, I'll, I'll put into my audit file. Um, you can also summar, uh, summarize it by date first. Um, that might that might help a little bit if you have participants who are invested in multiple funds. So that is the contributions testing. Then the last test that I'm going to do is uh, a test of investment income. And so what we were doing before was taking, selecting a participant who had no activity during the year. They didn't have any contributions, no distributions. Uh, all they had was investment income. 
and we were comparing the return that they earned inside the plan to uh, a Morningstar report for that fund and analytically comparing whether the investment return on Morningstar was reasonable compared to what they earned in the, in the fund, in the plan. And it was very select, it, it, it brought our sample population down to such a small number that we really weren't effectively doing the test because most participants have activity. Most participants have either contributions or distributions or a fee allocation or something along those lines. So I didn't, we didn't feel that that was an, an efficient way to test the allocation of investment income. As I said before, there's only a few things that will affect a participant's balance. Contributions, distributions, fee allocations, forfeitures, and investment income. And so if you're happy with the beginning balance, if you've tested contributions and controls over contributions, if you've adequately tested forfeitures uh, based on the plan document, if you've adequately tested that a distribution was uh, to the right participant and was authorized and was the proper amount, the only thing left is investment income. And so if the ending balance is correct, investment income has to be correct. And so the way that we do this test is we obtain a report from Yahoo Finance. You can download um, the net asset values by participant, or I'm sorry, by, uh, by fund. And download it into Excel. And so for each trading day, it gives me the open, the high, the low, and the close, and the volume and the adjusted close. The only net asset value that I care about is the closing price. And I've got it for the entire year. And so I am going to try and import this into idea. And I'm going to get rid of the fields that I don't care about. I don't care about the opening. I don't care about the high. I don't care about the low. I don't care about the volume. And I don't care about the adjusted close. Make sense so far? All right. So now I am going to, I'm going to test Greg Brink's investment income. And so this procedure will, have, will work on any of the participants, but I needed to um, be able to show some of, the, um, some of the calculations that I'm doing for the slide for the presentation purposes. Um, so I, I already selected Greg Brink as the person that I wanted to do this test for. So Greg's invested in the Fidelity Fund, and his beginning balance when I look at the participant summary report is 23.1962. If I look at that Excel file, his net, a net asset value of that fund on December 31st, 2013 is $10.17. show you that real quick. $10.17. And so if it was $10.17, he owns 228.08 shares on December 31st, 2013. Go back to idea. And what I'm going to do is I am going to I am going to take from my data my 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 total data, and I am going to extract. only Dave's income, or only Dave's transactions, or Greg, I'm sorry, Greg's transactions. So this is only Greg's 
detail. And I'm going to join that with the detail of the fidelity fund, just the net asset values. And all I care about is having this closing net asset value. We we'll do matches only. I'm going to match based on the transaction date. So those, obviously, in a join uh, function, you don't need to have the exact same uh, field labels. And so I've added, basically, uh, a, a column, a field that has the net asset value on the transaction date. I'm going to add a field called shares transacted. I uh, will do three decimal places. And we're going to take the amount and divide it by that net asset value the net asset value on that date. And so if we had a transaction of $55.38 and the net asset value on that date was $10.24, that means that Greg purchased 5.408 shares of that fund on that date. If we look at the field statistics, I can see that if I add up all of the transactions, he purchased 146.386 shares for the year. So a combination of um, contributions and dividend reinvestments added up to 146.386 shares. So we earned 228 at the beginning. He bought in an additional 146, so he has 374 shares at 12.31, 14. If I go back to my Excel schedule, um, I can verify that the net asset value on December 31st, 14, was $10.55. $10.55 times 374.47 is an ending balance of 39.50.6. I compare that to what the participant detail says, and it's materially accurate. And so if I'm comfortable that his beginning balance of 23,1962 is accurate, and I'm comfortable that 1440 is accurate, I think that I can reasonably assume that the 191.14, which is inclus inclusive of dividends, interest, realized, and unrealized capital appreciation, that's accurate. And so um, obviously we have to evaluate the SOC 1 reports and we um, you know, can, can rely on those to verify that there are, operate, there are controls that are operating effectively over the allocation to the participants of investment income, but we've tested it in our plan. And we've come up, we, we can make a reasonable conclusion that investment income is allocated. Any questions on that? And that's it. Um, any other follow-up questions or anything like that? Anything that you want to go through again, demonstrate? Chris, we did have a virtual question. Okay. Uh, John is wondering if you have ever seen an instance of manipulation of the investment income allocation? No, I have not. Um, the, 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 the plan sponsor um, generally doesn't have, if, if there's a fraud risk that we've identified that the investment income is improperly allocated, the fraud risk is going to rest at the plan sponsor level. And so the CEO is going to um, you know, override controls and say that, um, hey, you know, allocate a little bit more investment income to me instead of to the rank and file employees, and so that's what the fraud risk is. Um, and 
uh, no, the, 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 the plan sponsor generally doesn't have that um, ability. There's more of a risk that they're going to misappropriate contributions, they're going to uh, mis miscalculate forfeitures, something other than the investment income. But um, nevertheless, we do feel that is a, it is important to at least address the risk that investment income is improperly allocated at the participant. Okay, great. That seems in line with what John has seen in his past also. Do you have another follow-up? Uh, follow-up. Early on, you had noticed that there was a skip contribution. What did you, in your testing, attribute to that skip? So the, 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 the question was, um, when I did the, the test of the delinquent contributions, um, there was a, a contribution that was remitted late. And I, I unfortunately have seen that in my audits. And um, a lot of times it's, um, hey, I thought I hit submit, but uh, when I went to reconcile the July statement, I figured out that I had submitted the federal withholdings, but um, John Smith Controller had never authorized me to send the contributions to, to John Hancock or um, the HR manager was off that week and the, the, the person who was subbing in, um, they didn't know that they had to send not only to Fed at the state, but they needed to send the contribution over to, to John Hancock as well. Did you do a field statistics on the number of contributions to make sure it was in line with the number of payroll cycles? Yes. Yes, yeah, you can do a field statistics, sure. Um, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if it would be. Um, or well, you would you would bring down a task of all your biweekly, right. or your monthly, yeah. your monthly employees to double check that yeah. weekly versus your. Yeah, you can separate it out if the if the data that you have has um, you know what type of employee they are. If they're um, you know a, a a labor employee, they're paid weekly versus an office employee is paid you know every two weeks or something along those lines. Now this one, the contribution wasn't skipped; it was delinquent. And so I'm my employees or the plan sponsors employees are paid every two weeks. So I would expect that there would be 26 contributions for the year. And I do see that there's 26 contributions. Okay. So when I summarized it by date, I've got 26. So that's an analytical procedure, absolutely. But it didn't catch it didn't catch my um, my late contribution. So it wasn't a skipped contribution remittance. It was a late contribution. Which you can see there that it's that all of the contributions were made. All the contributions were made, but one, but one of them wasn't made right. timely. Right. Okay. Yes. And you can do, you know, you can do all kinds of analytical procedures here. Um, so I've got 10 contributions on on January 10th. I've got 10 contributions on the 24th. Um, but I go up to 11 on 5:16. What the heck happened on, in May? Ned, Ned was hired, and so he decided that he wanted to participate. And so that's an analytical procedure. Obviously, analytical procedure is you got to meet, uh, you got to set the expectation first and compare it to the actual information. So our expectation is number one, I got 26 contributions. Number two, um, uh, I should have a contribution for each of the participants that are remitting. Um, you know, should the should the amounts be consistent? So um, I've got 1167 all the way up until my 11th one, or I've got 1242. So for the rest of the year, I should have 1242. Well, I don't. I've got 1252 later on. But what else happened in my plan? Um, somebody got a raise. And so if I look at that person who got a raise's details, you're going to see that they had, I think it was 8% contributed before and after the raise. And so that makes sense. So. You know, you can do a lot of analytical procedures on this contribution information and reach a lot of a lot of credible contribution conclusions. Were there any other questions, Kelly? 
It doesn't appear as though there is. We really appreciate all of your time today. Outstanding. I, I again, I apologize for the IT issues, but I hope this was a, uh, a very informative session. And if you have any any follow up questions, my contact information is on, on the slides. Uh, you can get those slides in uh, a PDF format. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Great job, Chris. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.